Today we're going to be talking about anti-gravity. And we're also going to see, could we have already had this technology for a very, very long time and it's being kept secret from us. So I really think that you'll enjoy this. The idea of anti-gravity is you are shielding an object, a human something, from the effects of Earth's gravitational pull that wants to pull everything down towards its center. So just so we are not confused, this is different than what satellites and astronauts experience while they are in space. This used to be called zero gravity, but now that's been replaced, the more proper term is microgravity. Because even in space, they're still under the influence of Earth's magnetic field. Now the reason they are floating is very similar to if you're in an elevator and right when it starts up, it suddenly lurches. They are essentially free falling. And the only difference between us jumping up and coming back down versus them not is they are moving very rapidly horizontally. So they are falling, but they're moving so fast horizontally that Earth's surface curves away from them as they are falling. And so this is what makes an orbit. This is also why most astronauts, when they're first in space, will get uh, essentially seasick or space sick for a couple days. What amazes me about this this idea is first derived by Isaac Newton in his epic work Principia way back in 1658. That is almost exactly 300 years before they put up the first artificial satellite Sputnik 1. One of the possible keys to unlocking anti-gravity is to unite the four fundamental forces. So I want to do a really quick crash course in these. These are the four forces and some physicists might think there might be a fifth force but we haven't found it yet. These are four that are essentially irreducible. You can't break them down to smaller things. So we have the strong nuclear force. This is the force that holds together the nuclei of atoms. We have the weak nuclear force. This is responsible for radioactive decay. We have electromagnetism. This controls everything from electricity, magnetism, and also it allows electrons negatively charged to stay attracted to the positively charged nucleus. Finally, we have gravity, which causes planets to orbit stars, moons to orbit planets, etc. So these are the fundamental forces. At the atomic level, electromagnetism is 39 times stronger than gravity. But once you get out onto the level of stars and planets, it's actually gravity that's stronger. But they both interrelate to each other a lot. We also have quantum gravity. Now, gravity is an outlier between the four forces. The other three work on teeny tiny subatomic particles. As far as we know, gravity does not. It works on what's called a field, basically bent space-time. But some physicists are actually looking for a fundamental gravity particle. So, let's say that we aren't able to unite these forces within our lifetimes. What are some other methods that we currently have where we could maybe fake anti-gravity a different way. Idea number one is pretty cool. It's called acoustic levitation. This is basically levitating objects using sound waves. You can see they're doing it right there with a spider. And you have to very carefully place objects at the right distance between the transducer making the sound waves and the reflector reflecting them. If we go a little bit further, the type of wave they're actually using are push-pull waves. So real quick, take a look at this bottom diagram and think about you and a friend holding a slinky. If you all move the slinky back and forth like this, that makes an S wave, that makes a transverse wave. Instead, if you take the slinky and push it straight back and forth like this, that makes a longitudinal wave. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. The other issue is sound waves are different than light waves. Light waves can just propagate across a vacuum. It's why we can see the sun and things in outer space. Sound waves, though, do not. That's why in outer space, technically, it's silent. So these are objects that when they are cooled down to a critical temperature, they exhibit a phenomenal characteristic. They will basically repel a gravity field. They lose all electrical resistance, and when that happens, the electrical field will stay outside the object on the surface, and that makes gravity actually get repelled. So in this image, you can see the superconductor at the bottom, and it looks frosty because it has to be cooled down really, really low. And then we have a magnet levitating up above it. This works due to something called the Meissner effect. A scientist named Meissner figured out if this is how the normal electrical field of an object would be, once you cool it down low enough, it repels that field and it stays out on the surface. And this is actually what repels gravity. 
We have many elements so far on the periodic table that have been identified as superconductive, but only one type is actually good. The green ones are not ideal because the temperatures have to be too low and the pressures have to be too high. The ones we really want are the blue ones. It can be normal pressure at sea level and temperatures do not have to be quite as low. So in 1911, superconductors are discovered but the first one they discover has to be cooled the whole way down to 263 degrees Celsius below zero. And for those of you keeping track, that's only 10 degrees above absolute zero, the lowest possible temperature there is. Now we had a big breakthrough in 1986. Superconductors were created that only had to be cooled down to 180 degrees below zero. Why is that a big deal? Because that is within the range of very commercially available liquid nitrogen. So now any cool physics teacher out there, even at the high school level, can make things superconduct. This chart is very complex. All you need to understand from it is notice all the lines are trending upwards. You can see all the exotic combinations of elements that physicists are making right now to make superconductors. Now another idea that might be likely is magnetic levitation. So a man named Earnshaw came up with a theorem and it's correct, and it's impossible for traditional magnets to just nonstop levitate against gravity. And so for this, I actually brought a model that I have up front here. That is not a trick, it's not being held by a string. That moon globe is currently levitating. You can even give it a spin and it'll spin for a really long time. Now can anybody tell me, since it's not touching anything, if I give that a spin, will it spin forever? Very good, it will not, because since we're not in a vacuum, it is touching the air, and so eventually the air will slow it down. All right, so we got it spinning. This will spin for probably a good five minutes or so until the air around it suddenly slows it down. Here's the electromagnet right here. The electromagnet is very cool. It adjusts to fluctuations in temperature and air pressure. Now watch, as soon as I pull the plug out, see? So the electromagnet has to be working according to Earnshaw. If it's not, it can't just levitate based on those couple magnets. Now there is one exception to this rule and it's very, very cool. This is called dimagnetism. There are certain objects in nature that will naturally repel a gravity field and they do not have to be cooled down to do this. We have an example there. This is called pyrolytic carbon. It's really cool. It is like graphite. And if any of you are familiar with graphite, which makes up pencils, it's very soft and smeary. That's why pencils work. It's because it's in different sheets of carbon. Pyrolytic carbon is a little different. Some of the sheets are bonded together, and it will actually make it dimagnetic. So far, this is the biggest object that scientists have been able to levitate through dimagnetism. They did this in the Netherlands. Water itself can actually be dimagnetic. So they put a very strong current through the water and they were able to levitate a frog. Wait a minute, that sounds a lot like a superconductor. Good job, audience, very well done. That's exactly what it's like. So the good news is, dimagnets don't need to be crazy cold. They can happen right at room temperature. I think all the elements of Earnshaw's theorem are here. Earth is basically a big bar magnet. The only thing it would have to do if it was traveling from the North Hemisphere to the South Hemisphere, it would rapidly have to switch polarity so it matched up. This might sound far-fetched, but our airplanes already use this.